Greetings, this is Greg. The Messerschmitt BF109 used an inverted V-type engine. So did the 110, the Stuka, the Heinkel HE111, the Folke Wolf FW190 Dora 9, the Fiesler Stork, and quite a few others. In fact, almost every German airplane from World War II that used a V-type engine used an inverted type. Yet, nearly everywhere else in the world, when a V-type was used, it was upright. There are a few exceptions. For example, there were some Japanese and Italian planes that used license-built versions of German inverted V-12s. And there was the very short-lived Boeing XP-8, which used an inverted Packard V-12. But these were the exceptions and not the rule. In some cases, as with the FW-190A series, they went with a radial, but even the 190 eventually switched over to an inverted V12 for the Dora 9 variant. So what was it about the inverted V12 that made it so desirable to the Germans? Normally in these videos I quote original primary source material, meaning either NACA, NACA reports, manufacturer's data or test data from some agency that was testing airplanes during the period, like the U.S. Army Air Force, Royal Air Force, etc. This video will be a bit different. I was unable to find any primary source data to definitively answer this question. Even Taylor's book from the Smithsonian doesn't make any mention of this. By the way, the book is a free download, and if you would like to learn about aircraft piston engine history, you really should get it. Again, it's, it's free. Now, I did find an occasional sentence in other books here or there, but nothing that was verifiable and nothing that comes from a primary source, so in short, no smoking gun on this issue. So, for this discussion on the inverted V design, what I'll do is cover the various reasons a designer might choose an inverted type over an upright, and I'll tell you which reasons I think were the primary considerations for the Germans. I think my reasoning is sound, but you'll have to judge that for yourself. Of course, if any one of you have another theory, please share it in the comments. And if anyone can provide information from an original primary source, I think we would all love to see it. So let's start by taking a look at a conventional V8. This one is a Hispano Suiza V8 from the World War I era. The general layout of a typical aircraft V8 is with the valve mechanism at the top, the cylinders below, then the crankshaft, and at the bottom an oil sump. In most automotive applications, the sump would contain the engine oil, meaning it would essentially double as an oil tank. In most, but not all, aircraft applications, now especially warplanes, this sump will be the dry sump type, meaning it's just a collection point from which the oil is pumped to an oil tank separate from the engine. So why flip it upside down? Well, I think the main reason is that in a single engine airplane, with the engine in front of the pilot, it improves visibility. In the case of the Fiesler Stork shown here, visibility in the forward and downward direction is improved by the use of an inverted V-type. It's using the Argus air-cooled V8. I think another very important reason is ease of maintenance. Most of the components a mechanic will have to work on are relatively low and within easy reach once the cowling is open. In the case of the BF-109, using an inverted V-12 has both of these advantages, which are important to a frontline fighter. Additionally, it moves the exhaust stacks down, thus if flying at night it reduces the flash from the exhaust stacks, which would degrade the pilot's night vision. I don't think this was a primary consideration, as the 109 was never seriously used as a night fighter, but it was probably at least a small or contributing factor to the design choice. In addition to the visibility and ease of maintenance, there's another factor for the 109 which I think was important. The use of an inverted V-type reduces the frontal area of the airplane. The 109 wasn't a particularly slippery airplane, but keeping the frontal area to a minimum helps performance. I'll explain. The 109 uses fuselage-mounted landing gear. While this design results in narrow gear and thus a relatively high amount of losses on takeoff and landing, 
it does have some advantages. The 109's wings can be easily removed and the fuselage can be rolled around without the wings. This makes production and ground transportation of the airplane relatively easy. Since the fuselage has to be wide enough at the bottom to accept the landing gear, and at the top more or less only wide enough for the pilot's head, an inverted V allows for the minimal frontal cross section. In fact, if you look at the 109, you will see that the entire fuselage is shaped to take advantage of this. That inverted V shape is continued from the cowling all the way back to the tail. Compare this to the more boxy shape of the Spitfire. This rectangular shape is common in aircraft using upright V-12s. The inverted design also moves the weight lower in the fuselage and thus lowers the center of gravity. As all of the aircraft axis run through the center of gravity, depending on other design factors, this could improve roll rate. Not all German airplanes had all of these advantages. For example, the Stuka does have the forward visibility advantage and of course the advantage in uh, terms of accessibility for maintenance, but its landing gear is mounted in the wings. The BF-110 doesn't get much advantage in terms of visibility and neither does the HE-111. So I suspect that when the German Ministry of Aviation, called the RLM, laid out the specs for German fighters in the early 1930s, they specified an inverted V-12 primarily because of advantages in forward visibility, which affects all the single-engine airplanes if they have the engine in the front, and also for the advantage in maintenance, which was going to affect all the planes, period. Reduced flashing from the exhaust was probably secondary, and the reduced cross-section and fuselage-mounted landing gear were likely things that Messerschmitt did on their own, since these design features are not even close to being present across all German single-engine aircraft. Now to meet these RLM requirements, German companies, Daimler-Benz, Junkers, and Argus, all built inverted V-types. Daimler-Benz built the DB series of engines used in the 109 and others. Junkers built engines for the Stuka as well as the Dora 9. And Argus built the engine for the Stork. So, if the inverted V-type has these advantages, why did the Americans and British go with upright engines? With the exception of the Boeing XP-8 I mentioned earlier, which never made it to production, I can't think of any U.S. combat plane that ran an inverted V-type. There were some training aircraft that used inverted engines from Ranger, but that was about it. Designing a V-12 aircraft engine is an expensive undertaking. The manufacturer paying for development is going to want to get the best possible chance to get a good return on the investment. In the U.S., Packard co-designed the Liberty V-12 engine and manufactured them. Then, they developed the Packard 1A2500 in 1924. During the 1920s, this was a very successful aircraft engine, of which the 3A variant shown here was the most numerous. However, Soon Packard found themselves losing market share, a lot of market share, to the new air-cooled radials. In fact, they were losing so much market share that they converted their Packard V-12 to a marine engine and used it to dominate boat, boat racing. We're going to come back to the Packard V-12 in a few minutes. Rolls-Royce and Allison had to have seen this. They knew that the threat from air-cooled radials was serious, so in order to give their engines the best chances of success in the markets, they would have to be usable not only in aircraft, but anything else they could put them in, and that means tanks and boats. Building an inverted V-12 adds to the cost of the engine. It might not add a huge amount, but when you plan to bid on contracts to build tens of thousands of these things, saving even a small amount per engine really adds up. An inverted V-type has to use a dry sump, while most of these V-12s, especially in aircraft, use dry sumps anyway, it's a bit more complex and expensive in an inverted V-type because you need two scavenge pumps and two of everything else that's associated with those. Since you have oil collecting not at a single point, as in an upright V, but in two places, basically the left and right valve covers. Worse, maintaining an inverted V-12 in a tank would be a nightmare. A lot of the parts you would need to access would be deep in the bowels of the tank, not on top. 
in a boat, it wouldn't be much better. I can't think of a single tank or marine application ever that used an inverted V8 or an inverted V12. Think of it this way. When a mechanic walks up to an airplane in World War II, he would usually be standing under it, at least under the engine if he walked up to it. On a tank or a boat engine, he would usually be standing over it. So the optimal orientation in each case differs. So did marine or tank applications ever happen for aircraft engines, or is this just one of Greg's wild theories? Well, yes, it did. The British had a variant of the Rolls-Royce Merlin, which was called the Meteor. It was used in numerous British tanks, including the Crusader and the very fast Comet. The Merlin was also used in other less successful things. I think it's safe to say that when designing the Merlin, it was fortunate for Rolls-Royce that they went with an upright design. In fact, the Meteor variant stayed in production until 1964, far outlasting its aviation counterpart. In the U.S., aircraft radials were commonly used to power tanks. The M4 Sherman had numerous engine options, and of those options, two were aircraft radials. One was the Continental R75, which was essentially a Wright 975. That engine was used in a lot of airplanes, including, interestingly, the Messerschmitt M18 and the Sparrowhawk, seen here going aboard the USS Macon airship. The other aircraft engine used in the Sherman was the R1820, also very commonly used in aircraft, including the B-17. The Sherman tank has sort of a bad reputation. Most of the criticism seems to revolve around the idea of one versus one combat against a much heavier opponent. I'm not sure it makes sense to compare a medium tank like a Sherman to a heavy tank like a Tiger I on the basis of 1v1 combat. Even Germany's medium tank that people like to use for this comparison, which was the Panther, was 10 tons heavier than the Sherman and far less reliable. When looking at tanks, it's important to try and see the big strategic picture. By the way, I am going somewhere with this, and it is related to aircraft B-12, so just bear with me for a moment. A heavy tank, like a Tiger I, can be very effective on the battlefield. But what if you can't get it to the battlefield, then you have no tank, which is not good. Think of the logistical issues involved here. The U.S. had to ship tanks all over the world, and then keep them supplied with supply lines thousands of miles long, involving rail, ship, and truck, and sometimes air transportation. Now, not only do you have to ship the tanks, which are heavy, you have to ship the fuel, ammunition, and spare parts. Doing this with a Sherman, which weighs about 35 tons, is a big enough problem. Now do it with a Tiger at 54 tons, or even a Panther at 44 tons, and it's a far bigger problem. Remember, it's not just the weight of the tank, it's all the stuff needed to support the heavier tank, meaning more fuel, heavier parts, heavier ammunition, etc. Then, once you have the tank in theater and you manage to keep it running, if you're on the offensive, as the U.S. generally was, your tanks are going to need to cross bridges. Of course, the enemy is going to blow the bridges as they retreat, so that means your engineers, in many cases, will have to build bridges. The U.S. Army built pontoon bridges for this purpose, which the Shermans could cross. A heavier tank will need a bigger bridge, which will be harder and probably take longer to get into position and set up. So it's not all about armor thickness and firepower. Tank warfare in World War II, especially for the U.S., has a lot to do with actually getting an operable combat effective tank to the battlefield, and for that purpose the Sherman was excellent. Still, you have to take the threat, especially if you're a tanker in World War II, you have to take the threat of a heavy tank like a Tiger on the battlefield, or the even heavier King Tiger, very seriously. Now, in reality, with the benefit of 2020 hindsight, we know that the Germans didn't have enough of these things in Western Europe to alter the course of the war. There were actually very few times that U.S. Army Shermans encountered Tiger tanks after D-Day. Still, at that time, there was cause for concern. So, if you want to be really sure you're going to be able to defeat these new heavy tanks, one way to do that is to have a really big gunned heavy tank of your own. The Tigers had an 88mm gun. Let's build a tank with a 105mm gun, or so the thinking went. So the U.S. built this, the 64-ton 
T-29 with a 105 millimeter gun. Initially, it was powered by the Ford GAC V12 engine, which is a decent enough engine. I couldn't find a picture of one, but this is the V8 variant. Similar design, just 8 cylinders instead of 12. Anyway, someone decided to put in the slightly larger and more powerful Allison V12. If you've been following this channel, you know that Allison never really got to show what it could do during World War II. The U.S. Navy didn't want that engine or any other liquid-cooled aircraft engine, and the U.S. Army Air Force was married to the idea of using a turbocharger for second-stage supercharging. Thus, Allison focused on building a single-stage supercharged V-12 and bet on two aircraft with turbos for second stages. One was the P-39, which never got its turbo, which wasn't Allison's fault, and the other was the P-38 Lightning, which had a lot of issues in the European theater, and all of its problems also were not Allison's fault. So Allison sort of got the short end of the stick here. But now, in tanks, for a moment, it looked like it might finally be Allison's time to shine. Their engine is needed in the new U.S. heavy tank, which would be able to counter the King Tiger. Then the war ended. It turned out that the Shermans did just fine. In fact, the U.S. Army had to intentionally slow down to allow the Soviets to take Berlin first, per the Yalta Agreement. Both Patton and Churchill were quite displeased with that decision. Once the war in Europe ended, there was no real reason to continue development of the T-29, and thus ended Allison's very short run as a tank engine. Remember the Packard V-12 we talked about earlier? Well, all that work developing their aero engines for boat racing really paid off, and Packard got contracts to provide engines for PT boats. The Packard V-12, and this is not the Packard Merlin, was used in PT boats throughout the war and served very well. There were three engines per boat. The, the Packard V-12s could push these PT boats up to about 44 knots very fast. In fact, still fast by modern standards. For comparison, the U.S. Navy's modern Mark VI patrol boat has a maximum speed only one knot faster. There's a lot of confusion about the various Packard V-12s, but know that the Merlin, except in some experimental or testing situations, was not used in PT boats. Every operational PT boat used the Packard-designed V-12. The Merlin was not the only V-12 design Packard built during the war. Okay, so we got a bit off track, but I think that I showed there was a large market for aircraft engines in both tanks and boats, and in all cases, they used an upright V-12 as opposed to an inverted. So I think the Germans went with the inverted design primarily because it offered a number of advantages in aircraft. And I think the main advantages were visibility and ease of maintenance. Of course, in some cases, like with multi-engine airplanes like the 110, or even single-engine airplanes like the 190D9, the airplane's design minimizes the visibility advantage, but those planes were not around when the decision was made to develop the inverted V-12. In the U.S. and in Britain, I think the designers stuck with what they knew. Rolls-Royce and Packard were automotive companies, and of course automobiles used upright V-12s. Add in the fact that they correctly anticipated emerging markets for tank and boat engines. And the choice to build upright engines allowed the use of Rolls-Royce V-12s in a lot of tanks and the Packard V-12 in a lot of PT boats. Thanks for watching. Have a great day.